I'm super excited to have Paul here with us to talk about his journey. Um, you have a very interesting journey, Paul, of, of the things that you're doing with Bunny Hill Properties and the Whale Club and crypto and all kinds of cool stuff. So I think that there's a, a really nice um, underlying story of really how you're moving out of that initial hustle phase of, of starting a company and into more of a vi that viability stage and then all the other opportunities that kind of come with it from those lessons that are learned moving out of that out of that stage. So maybe if you maybe if you would let's start a little bit with your real estate journey and kind of tell us where that started, where you are now and then I'd love to hear more about, you know, Whale Club and kind of a, a, other ventures and how that all, the whole thing kind of played out. Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me. So, um I'm an engineer by trade. I got out of uh school in 2012 and decided like, I don't want to be an engineer. I did not like that. Um, <laughs> it's like, this sucks. Oh, I just, sorry, the 200 K <laughs> uh, you're telling me that's what my parents said to me. Um, uh. although I had to pay for a lot of my school. So anyways, I was a little like, what do I want to do? Um, and I found my way into technical sales. So I was using my you know, experience background and, and technical degree to sell equipment to some of the largest organizations in the country, Amazon, Walmart. Um, I spent about eight, nine years traveling uh, two cities a week. It was exhausting. Um, selling technology and innovation to some of these companies. And um, through that process, I started kind of getting a little sour towards traveling. And I was like, I really don't want to travel mainly because I was dating this girl back at home who's now my wife. And um, I was like, I got to stop this. It's like, I need to be home more. Um, so I was like, let's just start buying some real estate. Needed a house to live in anyways. Had to get out of you know my roommate's house, basically. Um, bought a house, realized wait a second, this just exploded in value in the last you know year. This was I guess 2017 when the values were just going up and to the right. Um, and remind everybody where your market is. Where did, where did you buy a house? I'm here in Denver. Um, so I bought a brand new townhouse because I didn't have any money for capital expenditures. So I was like, I, I need the builder to make sure that over the first year, nothing goes wrong so that I don't have to spend any money uh, if it does. Through that process, I realized that I could move out of that house, move into another house and put renters in it. So I didn't do the traditional like house hack where you throw a bunch of renters in there, but I did collect um, about four properties, which in Denver was, you know, all of them are half a million dollars and up. So accumulated quite a bit of equity pretty quickly. And I was like, wow, there's something to this. But what did um, you do? You lived in the property for a couple of years and moved, put renters in, then moved in like vice for and like kept, kept doing that? Correct. Um, so we did that three times. And I also bought an Airbnb. Um, as like a second home using that second home loan. And, uh, you know, that Airbnb cash flowed with the other two properties to pretty much cover our, you know, expenses. That's my like financially free story. We, we got financially free through collecting these properties. And, um, yeah. you know, it's not, it's a lean lifestyle. We, we moved out uh, into the suburbs and kind of downshifted our life. Cause I, told my girlfriend at the time, wife now, you know, like we're going to go full time at this. Let's go see if I can leverage my sales skills and our ability to, um, you know, to understand these deals, to find investment opportunities. Right. Um, and so that's what we did in uh, 20, 2020, I guess I left my job full time uh, to do this. And I started this. Um, I mean, traditionally it's a wholesaling company, right? That's, that's, I just call it a sales and marketing business. That's what it is to me. And, yeah. and we do marketing and we find deals and we connect buyers and sellers and all that sort of stuff. And so um, my first year in business was really a lot about like pressing buttons, as I like to say, uh, came in, we tried wholesaling, we did retail, we did um, all sorts of different strategies, fix and flips, developments. I really just needed to kind of test everything, see what I liked, see what I didn't like. Um, and I found out there's a lot of things I didn't like about uh, certain aspects of real estate, um, mainly flipping. That's probably the one thing that I do. Ter I'm terrible at flipping. Uh, so I stay away from that. Um, and then we, you know, Stephanie, and I have talked about this jump going from the, the, the hustle phase to like actually running a business. And mm -hmm. that's really what I've spent the last year doing 
is recognizing crap. I just made a whole giant mess here that I now need to like get data in. Like in order to actually have a reliable business, you need data. You need it to be predictable. And so that's what I set out over the last year to do. Um, and that's sort of where I'm at today is what were uh, some of the really important data points for you in that in in that transition that changed it changed you know changed your hustle phase it started with marketing um as as where a lot of I think a lot of new business owners start it's it's the sales and marketing engine that's got to get up and running yeah um, and we really had no predictability with that a lot of that has to do with you know you'd send out a direct well you know, we started using Investor Machine, right? Jason yeah, Lewis yeah. is a friend of mine and um, part uh, in, in, in the Whale Club now with me too. And that's how I got to know him. And I love that model of they'll just do it for me because I spent all this time, <laughs> you know, pulling the lists and managing the return mail and like, ah, it's just way too much. Um, and so the problem that we had in our first year was you'd send out mail and then it wouldn't really be for another six months till you could actually have enough data to be able to determine did that work or not. Right, um, yeah. And so that's what we spent the last year setting up is, you know, uh, all of our direct mail campaigns and driving leads in and then, okay, what's our process for follow-up? Um, and what are some of the other lead sources? Besides so I mean, your... we've, we've done a bunch of things in the past. We've done cold calling and texting and direct mail primarily. Um, I think now we're moving more towards a digital personal branding uh, yeah. type model. Um, it's because it's cheaper, frankly. Um, but yeah, cold calling, texting, direct mail. That was our bread and butter for the first two years. And we still do a lot of that. Uh, and the problem that we had was just not being able to tell what's working and what's not. Was it the direct mail or was it the cold call or was it the text? And um and so, you know, being able to organize all that information inside of Salesforce has helped us get closer. I mean, I'd be lying if I'd said I had to have a, have a handle on every aspect of our business. That's yeah, absolutely not right. true. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but we're getting closer and closer and closer towards that, you know, viability, that predictability in my business. Um, and it all just comes back to tracking data. Yeah. How did that data help you um, organize your team? Like, what did, what did your team look like? you know, a year ago versus now? Let's see. So a year ago, um, we're, we're probably getting into a different story. My evolution as a business owner is my evolution as a, as a leader. Well, um, so I, that's so true. I think that's true for all of us. And so my first year in business, I mean, the first probably seven or eight people that, hi that I hired came right in the door and right out. Right. I didn't know how to hire. I didn't know how to keep people. I didn't know how to train people. I didn't know how to set people up for success. It's just like, yeah, take this lead and go sell something. What's the problem? That was my strategy. Right. That's not a good way to run a business. Um, so this time last year, I was scrambling to replace all the people that I had run off from my business. Um, and Fast forward a couple of months from there, uh, we had we had a couple salespeople. I've got someone who helps me on the project management side. My wife actually is an agent, so she's kind of helping on the retail side. Um, and I've also found that having two salespeople is better than having one because it it helps to you know create that healthy competitive environment that we want. So where we're at now is I've got a couple salespeople, I've got a project manager, my wife does uh, retail, I've got someone who's helping us with content production and, and an executive assistant um, who's helping me kind of manage more of like a COO in training type of person there. Um, and that's what my business looks like now. Did you, who, who, who handles your leads? Did, are your acquisition people doing that? We don't have a lead manager. Yeah. Um, mostly because I've made mistakes hiring lead managers, uh, not local, right? Someone, yeah. Uh, virtual assistant because I just didn't have the money to, to pay them or maybe that was a limiting belief that I didn't have the money to, to pay them. Um, so we don't have a lead manager. We, we just, our acquisitions team handles all the inbound leads and they're taking that from, uh, you know, from incoming lead to executing on the contract. Yeah. Walk through that system really quick. I feel like that's a really important core system um, that produces a ton of information, a ton of data. 
for people to interpret. Kind of walk us through that evolution, you know, since hiring, since hiring those core acquisition people and how that how they manage the leads and how you help guide them, you know, be better closers. Yep. So what I've what I think what I've learned about this this business is um is uh your your ability to to negotiate is probably the most important. Um and I think also the ability to to recognize what to spend your time on. Um that's a mistake I've seen make I've made over and over and over in this business is chasing deals that really aren't deals. Um which is a this is a risk to having your acquisitions handling the leads is right. they have a tendency to just be like no I don't want that one. I don't want that one. I don't want that one. I'll take this one because I can close this one. Yeah. Um, so I recognize that that's a leak in my bucket right now that I'm I'm working towards uh, fixing. Um, but at the same time, I want my acquisitions team focused on the deals they can close. So I'm okay with a little bit of inefficiency there if okay. it, if it means that we're getting the deal. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's probably one of the things I'm going to work on going into 2023 is how do we get better at nurturing a lot of the leads inside of our CRM? Because I can tell you, I've got a whole, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of leads that we had a conversation with, the acquisition person filtered them out, and now they're just sitting there. Um, and, and we're putting them into drip systems, of course, with the help of, you know, Left Main and a lot of the tools and resources that you're giving us we're working on implementing. But what I've also found is Salesforce has so much capability that if you come in and try to do everything all at once, yeah, you're going to spin your wheels. Like you have to get one thing done and then go to the next thing and then go to the next thing. Um, so our thing was how do we close the, the deals that are in front of us? How do we get better at closing those deals? And I think that's where we saw a lot more reliability and stability in our business. Although there's still inefficiency there, we can predict that like, hey, if we can get in front of these sellers, we're going to get these deals. Let's focus on making sure we get that fish in the boat. And now we're kind of circling back and saying, we got a lot of, we got a lot of leaks here. Let's plug these leaks up. Well, so it sounds like you were able to kind of quickly identify what makes somebody a hot lead that the acquisition rep can concentrate on. Did that surprise you, that criteria that that ended up being? Like, what, what is that criteria? How, how, why is that okay to ignore this lead versus this other lead? Well, is it first response time? Is it, you know, lead source? Dig into that a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess first of all, I would say like I, I think Charlotte and and Denver might have some commonalities. Yeah. Um, what I've noticed about our market, it's it's not the Midwest. Like we don't have we're going after a price point that's you know five hundred thousand dollars and up most most of the time, uh, and so these folks have a lot of equity built into these properties that they've gained over the last ten years, okay. and. And so what I've found specifically for my market, I, this is not a blanket statement. This is just like what I'm noticing in right, my market right. is that there's not as much what I call hyper distress. Like I got to sell my house now. And if I don't, I'm in big trouble. We're not really, we're not getting those leads as often as we're getting the like, I could sell it, but like, how do I sell it? Yeah. It's really the question. This is why I'm really interested to hear what you kind of distilled this down to, because that's my experience too in Charlotte. And I think probably a lot of other people, especially with the market of being so hot, that distress in general kind of went down. Like it was few, fewer leads were calling in, like, I really got to sell my house. I don't care about whatever. They were like, well, let's see how convenient this is for me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, to sell. And did it, did you check all my boxes? And then maybe I will. Right. right. So I, I think that that's really interesting too, that you're seeing that. And I think a big value add that you could, you know, share with everybody is like, okay, well, what were the top items then? Because that's what we were all used to. Like, we're all trying to buy motivated leads, right? And then what if they're less motivated? What were the other factors that were like, these I know we can close. So let's focus on, you know, the 80-20 rule, right? Like, these are the things. Exactly. So what else was it if it wasn't like that, that kind of urgency motivation? It's a connection. It's, it's an authentic vulnerable connection between you and that seller. And if you can build that authenticity and that trust, we got, we got, we got a deal there. Like there's something that can be done when we've, we've turned 
sellers into private lenders. We've done novations. We've done creative finance deals. We've structured creative development opportunities. I mean, this is, this is the, the niche that I've sort of found myself in. Um, and I, I've said this to, to my team a lot of times. I, I, there's in these big markets, these hyper competitive markets, um, as a small business owner, oftentimes it feels like you're shooting Nerf bullets. Like there's, there's so many big players in, in your market that are always going to be able to outspend you. Right. I'm, I could spend 15, 20, 30, 40 grand a month and it still wouldn't touch the home investors and the net worth and the new Westerns of my market, right? They're just going to always outspend you. They're going to have better data. They're going to be the ones that are blowing up these hyper distressed people because they're, they're low, it's low hanging fruit, right? So I realized like, I'm just not going to be able to compete there. Yeah. Um, I don't want to compete there. I want to compete on my ability to build connection with that seller. So really the, the filter is as simple as this. Can you build a connection? You know, we talk about, you know, are you able to solve their problem? Are you able to add value to them? Sometimes they don't even realize that they have a problem. They don't realize what needs to be done. And so the way that I train my sales team is to focus on that connection, focus on building that relationship as opposed to going in and trying to buy the house for as low as you possibly can. Because we have so many other tools in our tool belt uh, like I mentioned, novations and creative finance deals. And we focus on trying to understand, you know, if, if there's, if there's, if they need to sell their house in three weeks and they need cash quick, you know, we can do that. Yes. But we're competing against so many other people who can also do that. So it's a commodity game at that point. You're just, you're just price eroding each other. So we focus on the value add opportunities, the middle ground, you know, um, and I think that's where we've had most of our success. We're just not trying to fight it out in a war of attrition with the guys who got bigger guns and more bullets. We're just not going to win that battle. I really like where you're going with this. So I'm seeing kind of like the general theme being, okay, we can keep our team small um, because we don't have to have like a giant team to manage a ton of stuff and we can niche down um, in these kind of specialty offerings, right? Like Correct. with this team, we're niche down, we're gonna try to establish that relationship. So what's your measurable there? Like, are you looking at call duration time, you know, leads contact, are you looking at appointments? How are you, how are you evaluating this relationship building and rapport building with your sellers? Yeah, it's Coaching. a really good question. Um, and I came, you know, you have to remember, I came from the world of, high ticket sales, right? I was selling five, 10, $20 million deals to some of the largest organizations out there. And so making that transition to this more like transactional volume based game took me a little bit of time to adjust. And I think what I realized is like, that's just not really my game. I don't want to battle it out over volume. And I don't ask my salespeople to do that. That's a preference, not you know, not a, a binary statement. Like it doesn't, it's not right or wrong. It's just, this is my preference because I have skill sets in a different area. Yeah. Um, so what we do is we just have a very uh, pretty simple format for how we lay out our week. On Mondays, we, uh, we talk about our rocks. Um, you know, that's the, that's the traction term. We call them moguls uh, in our business, right? Because we're all a bunch Ooh. of skiers. Moguls. Well, I was gonna say, I was gonna yeah. Say, so as you're skiing, right you got to get past these moguls, right? We call them moguls. Um, on Tuesdays, we do sales training. So we spend, you know, 30 minutes to an hour training on the specific objections and things that they've overcome. Okay. Um, Wednesdays, we do accountability. So we review what I call their top five. So it's like, I just want to know who your top five deals are right now, right? I want them notated in Salesforce so I can see them, so I can keep track of them. Um, because again, my focus is more on the 80-20 style of things. Do I have leaks in my bucket? Yes. Is Salesforce here to help me solve those leaks? Yes. But we can't catch every rabbit at once. We've got we to make sure that this is moving forward. So my you know, communication to my team is like, we have to focus in on the most important deals and do whatever we've got to do to get those deals across the finish line. So we talk top five and we talk top 20. Uh, Thursday, we do deal review, right? Which is like uh, 
let's talk about what went well or what didn't go well in this in this particular negotiation. So most of my focus is on more of a uh, qualitative approach and less on a quantitative approach. Yeah. I know you probably would slap my wrist a little bit for not uh, having as good of data, but I think that actually represents the reality of the journey of a business owner. Your yeah. data is not going to be perfect. It's going to take some time. You have to give yourself grace and you also have to make sure that like deals aren't falling through. So right. that's really my approach. Yeah. And, and I think we all have similar data points, but different depending on what kind of business that you're trying to run, you know, like I've, I went the volume route, which means I needed a huge team to do that. If you're going the, the qualitative route, you don't necessarily need a big team. You're going to have different data points to evaluate that than I would. You know what I mean? And that doesn't sure. mean that either one of us are correct or incorrect. So I think this is really interesting. You know, I, I think, well, actually, before I get to my next question, I don't want to get too ahead of myself. Um, I would venture to guess that because you're, you haven't gone the commodity route, um, you've gone the relationship route, that it's easier for you to dispo a deal. And would I be able to guess correctly on that? Like, do you have better grace with your with your homeowners and being able to find an end buyer? Or how are you navigating this dispo side of the equation now that the market's shifting a little? Man, that's that's where we're at right now. Like, this is the top, this is where the rubber meets the road, right? Like I've been saying uh, to my team that like the last two years has been order taking. Sorry, you just been taking orders. That's not sales. Right. Um, and so things are about to change, right? We need to prepare ourselves for this change. And so um, you might laugh, but uh, I have this, we, we just started rolling out my, our, our Q1 you know, plan. I don't know if you can tell I'm a math nerd. I have uh, the, the theme of, our, of, our, of next year really is Newton's second law of motion, which <laughs> says that momentum equals mass times velocity. Yeah. So what we're trying to build on our team is relationship momentum. We want more people taking steps towards us. Yeah. So that comes into two variables, the mass. We need to know more people, right? We need to grow our database of people and we need to do more velocity, which is what I call, you know, it's activity to these people. We call those high quality touches on our team. I've stopped using the term appointment because I think the, the way that people do business nowadays is a little different than the traditional, like, did you go out on an appointment? Did you make a phone call? Okay, how long was that phone call done? Well, there's other, you know, I say this all the time, like most of my time outside of busy work and working is like, I mean, I hate to say it, but like I'm on my phone all the time. Like yeah. I'm on my phone all the time. Everyone is. So how can we reach people where they are? So we have things like handwritten notes, we do direct messages on Instagram and conversations that we track there. We track phone calls. I track appointments. I track um, like unique posts. There's a lot of leverage in social media, right? Yeah. If you're trying to stay in contact with a thousand buyers, what's easier, making a thousand phone calls or having a thousand people follow you and they're constantly seeing your, your content? That's valuable. Yeah. That's what we're operating under is we're a small team. We need to recognize where we've got big levers that we can pull. And, and so I'm having my team sort of shift their, their idea of what is a, an appointment to what I call a high quality touch. Um, and so if we can increase the number of people that we know and that we have relationships with, and we can increase the volume of touches to those people, we're going to increase the number of people stepping towards us over time. That's no different with buyers, sellers, uh, private lenders, anybody, right? You, you need to get in front of them and you need to add value to them and they'll start moving towards you. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is, I think real estate in general is fiercely local, right? Like street by street, things are different and it's difficult to know that if you're, that's not your mother market. Like when we're talking about these big eye buyers, right? Doing, making a commodity out of it. Um, and I think it's also very personal, right? And the and the relationship that you have with homeowners and sellers is what makes or breaks you. I would venture to say now that your relationship with buyers is what makes or breaks you. If that if you're in that wholesale model, I agree. Um, you know, I, I went. I was talking to somebody, and they 
what was it? I think it was, on, I was on Steve Trang's podcast not that long ago. And there, there was someone who commented, cause I said like, you better know your buyer's kid's birthdays. If they, if you made a hundred grand off your buyer, like you better know their kid's birthday. And somebody posted and was like, that's old thinking, but I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm selling houses. And I think that's what you need. Like you need to know what people's pain points are and what their goals are in order to help them, right? That's like, right. what are you trying to do uh, so that I can prov- could provide the proper solution? So it's, yep. it's, I think it's a difficult thing to scale at a huge corporate level. It is. Was, maybe it wasn't meant to do it like that. You know what I mean? No, and, and you're exactly right. I, um, you know, I think of more of like a, like a SEAL sniper team, right? As opposed to a big giant regiment going in. It's just, it, some people are going to gear more towards the volume game and some people are going to gear more towards the, uh, you know, the sniper approach. But everything in this business that I've learned over the last you know, couple of years doing this is that it's all about relationships, period. End of story. Like if you don't have a relationship um, you're going to lose out more times than not to the person who does, because this is not a commodity game. Not anymore. Maybe it was before, but found this on the web. Um, oh. Yeah. So I, I think that relationships are pretty much everything that matters in this business. And I'm, I'm trying to let the data guide us into uh, spending the most time with our highest quality relationships, whether yeah. that's a seller or a buyer. And it sounds like it's the sellers, you know, just kind of super high level. It sounds like those are the sellers that actually want to talk. Yeah. Right. And you also have to be careful of the, the seller who just wants to hang out because they like yeah. you. Right. So there's, there's, again, there's inefficiencies to every type of model and we're working through that right now, but yeah, that's how I use my business. Um, is t- it's really, uh, um, it's really a relationship game and it's, it's not necessarily a numbers game. It's about, I would say the strength of your relationships, although it helps to grow the, the size of your database. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm more of a, let's go deeper instead of wider. Yeah. I like that. So, you know, moving out of that, like hustle phase and more into that business ownership, that viability stage, what, do, what makes you feel like you're no longer in that hustle stage? What, what's the difference that you've experienced? Uh, the predictability of, of the business has just increased, right? It's not where I want it to be. It's just, I can tell that like consistently we're going to get two, three, four deals a month, right? We're not doing large volume. We don't need to do large volume. That's not what I'm, you know, I, I'm more interested in developments and raising capital and doing stuff like whale club. Like I love innovation, just like yeah. you love uh, left main, right? You built your yeah. business so that you could go pursue a lot of the, things that interest you in life. If that's not the definition of financial freedom, I don't know what is, yeah. right? So I want my business to serve me. And what I get a lot of value in is relationship building. So I've designed my business to get me more relationships in addition to revenue. Yeah. I'm sure that's impacted too. You're just, your employee, your employee relationships, you know, and building into those, into those people and kind of being a coach, right? Do you find yourself being a better leader with those kind of same strategies or how you, how are you approaching your employees? I, I do. Um, and, you know, again, the way that I do things, I, I've observed it to be a little non-traditional relative to a lot of the people I see. We are, are shifting more towards this personal branding strategy where I am, um, uh, I don't know. I don't know how deep I want to go here, but (laughs) decentralized businesses, right? So if you know, uh, have you ever heard the the story of the spider and the starfish? No. So if you take a a spider, I mean, this is sounds bleak, I guess, and take one of his legs out, like he's still going to be okay. He's just, he's not as at full strength, right? And you keep taking one out, he's going to get weaker and weaker. That's a centralized organization, right? It all, it's, it's probably more profitable, but it's, it's more susceptible to, uh, let's say, vo- volatility in the market, all sorts of external factors. Um, a starfish, you can take a starfish and cut one of the corners off of him. He'll grow back his leg, and that leg will start growing another starfish, right? It's, a, it's truly a decentralized organization. It's really hard to kill that thing because 
if you cut him off, he's just going to continue growing. So we're trying to adopt the same model of the starfish in our business, where it's not just Paul running this business and it's my business and you all work for me. It's how do we promote the personal brands of everyone on our team, the unique personal brands of them and attract uh, relationships to them as well. And so I'm putting a lot of resources into helping my sales team, my wife, my project manager build out their own personal brand. Uh, I, I operate under the assumption that people buy people. They don't buy businesses. No one cares that your business's name is Bunny Hill Properties. They're yeah. buying you. They're doing business with you because you've built that connection. So I want to empower my team to have the same amount of leverage. So they're not just like, oh, yeah, this is this is Bunny Hill Properties. This is Paul's business. It's like, look, we're stronger. It's harder to kill a starfish because because it's so decentralized because Philip stands on his own and Nick stands on his own and Eliza and Sonia and right. Everybody has their own personal brand and value that they add. Um, I think that makes our team stronger. Well, it certainly promotes a lot of ownership, right? And uh, an overall direction of the cause of the company, you know? I mean, the military does a lot of stuff like that. I can't remember if it's, Jocko wrote that, uh, the book. I can't remember if it was an extreme ownership or um, his other one, but he talked about decentralized command and how that makes things so powerful. People have like teams that all contribute to the better goal, but the, the team is essentially its own command. So exactly. like, you know, the president is making every single decision in the military, right? Um, which may not be the most PC example to, to use, but I, I think that there's a lot of lessons to learn there from decentralized command and having people um, own the direction of their department and how that affects the whole company. So I think yeah. that's really interesting. I'd be, be a little worried that they'd want to like just pop off, right? I'm like, I can do this without, without Paul. How, how do you mitigate that? You don't. You just accept that as the risk. Um, you don't. You know, yeah. that starfish could break off and start his own thing over there. And, and I understand that. I think my, my intention is to add so much value to these people that I create lifelong relationships and partners. Yeah. Um, and again, that might be a problem if you have a volume-based business, right? If you got a relationship-based business, I'm not losing relationships just because someone went and did something else. Good for them, right? If they can amass the, uh, the resources and tools they need from me, in order to go launch their own business. I hope that that's a lifelong partner of mine and we can uh, you know, share in this abundance uh, that exists in the world, right? I don't operate under that. Well, what happens if they leave and steal all my information? It's like, guess what? I learned all this stuff from somebody else anyway. I stole it already. So how is it mine to, to, to hold hostage? It's like, if you can, again, that may be wrong. That may be naive as a new business owner. We'll see, time will tell. Um, but that fits with more of my personality and the way that I do business. And so that's how I design my business. Yeah. Well, that's, I think that rising tide will, you know, lift all those boats, right? Like if, even if somebody outgrows the company and decides to do something else that the company grew in the meantime with that person, you know what I mean? And it was yeah. like you said, mutually beneficial. So hopefully there's a, a peaceful parting and then we continue to have other ventures together. I think that, I think there, that can, there is a healthy way that we can do that too, you know? Yep. I hope so. We'll find yeah. out. Yeah. So, okay. So you got, you, you got Bunny Hill um, properties into a stable place where now it's predictable. It's the proper size. It's kind of the business that you want it to be. Obviously we all have our own things like that we want to improve. I'm never going to get to a point where I feel like I'm satisfied either. So I totally understand. Um, but you've gotten to your place of predictability, reliability. It feels like a business that you want to own. Um, and you're out of that like initial hustle phase to get there. Is that where whale club came in or how, what, what's that origin story? How or did you take the profits from that and then go into the crypto stuff? How, how, are, how do these whole, all these things tie together? So last year I had a problem with cash flow consistency. Like we just had lumpy sales, very lumpy, you know? Um, and that made it really difficult to create any predictability at all. I just, I, it was tough to make decisions because it's like the cash conversion cycles were all funky, like the flips and the developments and the wholesale and the retail, these are all different. I'm like, when, how much money do I have? And where is it? Like, I don't know where it all is. Yeah. Um, so, familiar. How about yeah. else? <laughs> <laughs> it's tough. Um, so I was fortunate to meet a mentor 
last year. This guy, um, I mean, this might sound hyperbolic. He helped Microsoft in the early 2000s build what, what they call their business treasury. So when you, when you look at any of these Fortune 500 companies, any of these large organizations out there, what you'll notice is that they have their operating business, but they also behave as a bank. They're a bank at the end of the day, right? They have Apple, Microsoft, Google. These have you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in investable assets. Okay. So much like us business owners, we got, we got you know, six months of reserves sitting in the bank. And then we got money coming in and out and all this sort of stuff. Well, Microsoft doesn't take their $200 million and stick it in Chase Bank. They don't do that. They use that money to invest, to create st additional stability for their business. And so this idea of, well, how do I behave as an operating business, but also as a bank so I can have some consistency in cash flow from the money that's just literally sitting I say eat, getting eaten away by the rats of inflation, right? It's just sitting in the bank doing nothing, but someone told me I needed to keep that money there. So by God, it's going to sit there. Um, what I found out how to do, is, and this is where kind of crypto came in. And I know that that's a pretty taboo phrase, term in the, in the real estate world. So Especially now, yeah. Especially that's now, awesome. right? So uh, without getting too technical, because I have a tendency to do that and I have a tendency to lose people, there's two types of really ways to invest in crypto. The first is how 95% of people do it, which is gambling. It's gambling. Let's call it like it is. You go on FTX, which is no longer. You go on Coinbase. You go on something like this and you buy a coin. And what are you doing? You're hoping that coin's going to go up in value. That's gambling. I mean, let's call it like it is. That's what, that's what that is. It's sort of like if we were to flip houses and all you did was go out and buy a house, you did no work to it, you got no you know, loans, no debt on it, and you just waited two years and hoped that it went up in value so you could sell it and make money. That's how people buy and trade crypto right now. Um, not a very good way, in my opinion, un unless you have a really long time preference. Like you're looking like five, 10 years out. It's like, I'm just going to hold this for five, 10 years. And I'm not going to look at it anymore. I'm not trading it. That's not what I'm doing. What I found out how to do is, so that's all on a centralized exchange. A decentralized exchange, again, without getting too technical, allows you to take the money that you have, U.S. dollars, and lend it to this exchange. Which they the take that. Say again, sorry? This is the crypto exchange that you're lending it to? Correct. Okay, so, so this, I just want to like back up a second because... I don't, crypto is, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't do it. So you have your operational expenses, like your six months reserves for Bunny Hill properties that's just kind of sitting in a bank, right? And you are now looking at those funds to lend into this exchange, right? Correct. Is that what it's set up? Okay, 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 go ahead. Sorry. And, I'm and I should probably clarify, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm putting profit there because I, my risk tolerance is like, I don't, I can't lose that. Yeah. Right. And so what I'm doing is there's a phrase uh, called a stable coin. Right. Okay. And a stable coin, there's a bunch of different types. I'm not going to get into that, but let's okay. just, just take my word died. for it. One of them yeah. recently died. <laughs> there's a bunch of trash out there. So yeah. let me just say that. Right. What I know how to do is determine the trash from the ones that are actually good. So okay. a stable coin ideally is one to one. Like you have a, you know, a piece of paper that represents a dollar. Here's a, here's a coin that's digital that would represent the same thing. Okay. So I convert the money that's in my bank to a digital version of that. And then I take that money and I lend it to an exchange. So in order for there to be trades, in order for anybody to buy and sell anything, like if you're trying to trade a stock, you have to have an exchange, like a stock exchange. Mm -hmm. What they're doing is they're providing liquidity. They're putting up all the money so that this guy can trade with this guy. Right. And, and it comes into the middle and he and, you know, take this money. OK, cool. I'm going to convert it to Bitcoin and give this back to you. So you have to have liquidity in order to actually have any trades. So what we're doing is we're taking our dollars and we're lending it to these decentralized exchanges so that they have liquidity to make trades. And just like with Coinbase, like take everybody's probably familiar with Coinbase, right? Yeah. They have. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that they get from institutional lenders that lend them money 
so that they can make these trades, those lenders get paid guaranteed returns. Just like in a private money situation, you lend your money, you get a return. Well, in a centralized world, we don't have an, people like us, we don't have an opportunity to participate in that. It's just not available to us. In the decentralized world, that's the whole point of this. Most people haven't heard of this because it started in 2019. This is a very, very new technology. And so we're taking advantage of this. We're able to lend our money to this exchange and earn anywhere from 4 to 12% on that principle, right? It gets returned to you in a coin. Now, these coins can go like this. Sometimes they'll go up, sometimes they'll go down, the coins that you're getting for free. And so what we, we don't want to do is like buy these coins with our principal, hoping that they go up in value. We want to accumulate them for free. So what I did is I basically had enough cash in reserves that I lent to these exchanges that it was kicking off enough cash flow that I was able to cover my business operating expenses and pay my employees salaries just off of that business treasury alone. Okay, so let me let me make sure I could, I've got this here, and and I will disclose I'm very skeptical about crypto, <laughs> but this seems a little bit different in a way. So, um, all right, so you're backing the exchange. You're not buying the coin and trading ba it. Backing it the exchange is 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 not technically correct because it's it's um, fully liquid. So like. If I think that's why I'm confused. Why, why does it, if it is already liquid, why does it need a lender? Because in a decentralized, so in any exchange, you need liquidity. You have to have liquidity, right? So the way that a centralized exchange gets their liquidity is from their balance sheet or from their lenders. And if okay. they run out of money, they go bankrupt and everybody loses. Yeah, it's a big- That sucks. It's a big in bankrupt. A yeah, exactly. In a decentralized exchange that doesn't happen why yeah. because it's decentralized because there's hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people who are lending their money to this exchange right so anybody can pull it out anybody can put it in at any point in time so i could take 100 bucks and stick it in and earn consistent cash flow on that 100 dollars and if that those coins tanked it doesn't really matter cuz my money is in us dollars it's not in a coin so it's all say again. Sorry. What is the risk there? The risk is that the coin that you're receiving as interest goes to zero. I see. So you're, you're not getting paid your interest in us dollars. You're getting paid your interest in crypto. And so and do you get to choose like what, what coin you want to get paid? Kind of. Yeah. You can choose based on what exchange. So if you're on a particular exchange, they're going to pay you in one certain type of coin. If you're on another exchange, they'll pay you in a different coin. So that's okay. that. the reason why I do this strategy is because it's all about mitigating risk. I want to limit the downside that I have. My entire principle stays in US dollars. So even if everybody pulled their money out of the exchange and the exchange crashed, my liquidity is still there. I can still take my chips off the table. It's not at risk. The only risk is when you acquire that coin and it goes to zero. Okay. So but, how are you monetizing that coin then? Are you holding I, it? What's your plan? I just sell it. Well, I sell it or what I do is you can actually receive this coin and then you can stake that coin again to earn another coin. So I'm building this giant flywheel where like, I don't know what coin's going to do well. I don't know what coin's not going to do well. So I, I start in dollars. I get a free coin. I take that coin. I stake it to get another free coin. And I just keep doing that over and over and over again okay. with the assumption some of these are going to crash to zero, right? But uh, some of them are going to do 100x. I've seen 100x multiple times in my short two-year journey into crypto. It's, it's, it's gambling, but you're taking all the risk out because I didn't pay for these coins. I got them for free. Right. So I have a I have a cash flow side of this um, again, without getting too technical. I've, I've, it's like it all filters into these different buckets. And yeah. one of the buckets is uh, coins I convert to U.S. dollars and move it back to my bank account. Well, that makes me feel better. I'm glad that you're doing that, too. <laughs> yeah. Take a little. So, I mean, 
it's it's a uh, like I, believe me crypto is not for everybody and uh i recognize that right which is uh i think it's going to take some time for folks in the real estate space to understand the value that this provides which is why most of my focus in the whale club is not yes i can show you how to earn passive income at a very high rate and i was able to cover my business expenses so my business essentially operates at net zero we don't yeah. do a deal i don't lose any money ever but what I'm most excited about is the actual applications of blockchain. And people confuse crypto and blockchain. Crypto is just, it's like an application of blockchain. And this uh, comes back to what you and I were talking about earlier around the first application that I think most people are familiar with is title and ownership transfer. Right. And people think, oh, this is a great application. And I agree, it is a good application. However, it's so far off because of the level of buy-in you need on such a local level. I mean, you've got all these counties that are, I mean, real estate was one of the last industries to adopt the internet, right? So, so slow to adoption. No, no surprise there. Yeah. They're not, you're not going to get some small town in Kentucky and some tiny, you know, little town in Missouri. Barbara. To go Missouri is still using fax machines. <laughs> They're not going to go on blockchain. Like, are you kidding me? And you and and if you don't have everybody do it, you've got to duplicate efforts. So it's it's not really very efficient. Yes, it it technically is a good application for it, but unless everybody buys in and does it, you know, I think it's ten years plus off. I don't think it's relevant. What I think is relevant right now is the fact that there's a trillion dollars in the crypto market. And these people don't know how to buy real estate. They don't know how to, they don't know how they've made. I, I mean, I'm not exaggerating here. One of my close friends took 50 grand and turned it into 40 million last year in crypto. The upside is tremendous, but they don't know how to get money out of there and into a real asset. So what we're doing is this is something called real estate tokenization. And we're taking a traditional fund so, you know, in a tr traditional fund, right, we're raising money and we're going to go out and buy single family homes. Well, how does this process work right now? It's like, let's say you're a fund manager, Stephanie, and I, I want to invest in your fund. Cool. I'm going to wire you a hundred grand. I got to be accredited first. I'm going to wire you a hundred grand. You're going to take that. You're going to put it in your fund and you're going to spit off cash flow. There's some value to that. Right. All that we're doing is we're taking that process and putting it on blockchain because it's easier to track and manage. And we're making it so that the crypto people can buy into real estate funds with their crypto. Of course, we're taking that crypto and immediately converting it to cash because I can't do anything with Bitcoin. Bitcoin can't buy real estate. We got to convert that to cash. But we're making it so that we're building this bridge between the two worlds, right? We can open up the trillion dollar market in crypto and give them a route to buy real estate where they don't have to, you know, this massive loop and then they won't they won't do that. They won't do the things necessary to pull it all out of crypto to get it back in. Why? Because I've tried the guy who made 40 million. I'm like, dude, let's put some of that in real estate. Like we got to get you out of that and into some tangible assets. He's like, ah, I don't really want to do that. Like, I don't want to move my money back to the bank account. It's a whole thing and wire it to you. It, it's, you know, it's it's the fundrise model. Same thing as Fundrise or some crowdfunding thing. It's just that you can pay with, with, with crypto now. That's all we're trying to do. And I think, I think this is definitely something that everybody needs to pay attention to what's happening in this market. Um, I honestly feel like it's 1990 and I'm 100 and you're trying to tell me what the internet is. You know what I mean? And I still don't freaking know what the internet is. I still don't get it, right? Um, and it's that crucial to all of our business and personal lives. But I, I do think that there, there, this is something that you need to pay attention to uh, and at least be aware of what's happening with it. Because like you said, there, it can unlock this equity or these funding opportunities for people who have these currencies they can't trade any other way. It's interesting. It's almost like drug money. You can't like deposit it into the bank. You know what I mean? That's great. Um, an another concept that I was speaking with somebody about out of Nashville, they're, they're trying to do something really similar, but basically allowing people to access equity in their house without selling it, uh, without having to sell their house by tokenizing their equity. So for example, let's say you own a house and there's $100,000 of equity. 
and you're 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 house rich but cash poor and you're like well shit i have no place to go i can't sell my house you know so how do i sell the house to you mr investor mrs investor if uh, i have nowhere to go and i can't afford another house right so they're they're looking at um how can we take that equity and essentially tokenize it like a stock, right? Like it's backed by the house, just like a loan would be, et cetera. And then how can I sell my token or use that as crypto in some way of accessing those funds in a kind of like this non-traditional way? I think, yep. I think kind of in the, in the weeds here, there is a solution, which is really interesting. Like you're saying, like all this crypto money, they can't put it anywhere. Can we put it into a special fund that's backed by real estate? Can we access, help people access the equity in their house with tokenization? Very interesting stuff. I feel like it's really still developing, you know? Well, and you, you like mentioning the internet, that's the best example we have of what we're dealing with here. And I love that you kind of just, you teed me up with this. <laughs> people don't understand technology through technical terms. Like yeah. if I started sitting here being like, well, crypto and blockchain is it's it's a digital immutable ledger. Like, what do you not get about that? Yeah, it's like, well, that's what the that's because we study the curve of adoption. The people who are in crypto right now are the innovators. They understand the technical side of this. Right. And so this is equivalent in my mind to the folks in like the early 19 late 1980s, early 90s. Right. Where what is the Internet? I don't know. We understand technology through the, the how we use it. Right. So when you're explaining the internet to your grandma, it's like, no, grandma, here's what the internet is. I can send you a, a message through the internet and you can get it on the other side of the country in seconds. We call that email. That's what the internet is. And she's like, oh, okay, I get what the internet is. And then it's like, oh, and here's another thing. You can go on online and you can type this question in. We call this a search engine. And it's going to spit you out an engine, you, or an answer. You can get any answer you want. So people understand technology through how it's useful to them, right. not technical facts and features. That's the problem right now is everyone who's in blockchain is talking about the technical stuff or they're just talking about crypto and FTX blowing up and all this, you know, fo uh, you know, we call FUD, fear, uncertainty and doubt. What we're trying to do is change the narrative around what is blockchain and how is it actually useful to us? And it's useful to us by raising capital. We can tap into a trillion dollar capital source. We can use it to um, create, like, for example, we talk about the Carfax model all the time. Right. Yeah. Um, what, what did Carfax do? They just tracked information with a right. car specifically. That is blockchain. That right. is what blockchain is. That's the best way I can understand it too. I'm like, it is Carfax. It's a VIN number. Yeah. It's a VIN number. We're just tracking this information so that if you have the car or I have the car, it's it's there. So again, I, I think that our challenge, my challenge, our community's challenge as folks who want to be you know positioned as the future leaders in this space is like, well, tell me why I should care. Tell me why it's useful to me. If right. you're just going to sit here and talk about buying and selling coins, like I'm going to tune out because I don't understand anything you're saying. And it also feels very risky. So yeah. that is where we're at as a community is really trying to bridge the gap of understanding of, and it, and it comes through stories, not through technical facts and features. Right. And, you know, the part that makes me interested enough to pay attention, you know, cause I'm, I'm a highly skeptical person. I'm like, ah, it's a fad, right? What makes me interested is, is the concept of access to funds, right? So, I mean, as we run our business, like we need private lenders, we need, we need access to funds, we need to raise funds, et cetera. And, I'm always looking at how we can get more access to capital, right? And my traditional way of that is like people or, you know, small hedge funds. Those are the tend to be the people who buy our properties or small hedge funds or people or they lend on it, right? So what's appealing to me and just kind of starting to understand this process is that there are, there's, like you said, trillions of dollars that are tied up in these coins that everybody's trying to scramble to figure out how can we make that in like everyday life stuff, right? Like dollars, like real estate, right? So I think that's that's kind of why I'm paying attention, right? And like, and I I am a little less, I'm a little more scared to jump into it, you know, two feet. Like I have like some stock in Coinbase, like I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. I just bought some stock there, and I left, and I sat and let it sit there. But I I think that this 
figuring out how to gain access to these trillions of dollars is, is similar to me, like getting access to a hedge fund, you know, yeah. like, okay, how, yes. how can I help them buy real estate? How can I sell them real estate? Um, and then that's how, exactly you know, right. Yeah. So how can I pay attention to this? So where, like, where would I, where would you say I should start or, you know, people listening to this should start in that lens? Like, okay, you want to pay attention to this because these, these people need to buy something. How do yeah. I help them buy houses? Where do you start? So this was a big problem because I, I am also a technical person if you haven't learned, right? Yeah. So my challenge, and I think what I did really well for 10, you know, eight, eight years before I got into this is help large organizations understand the power of technology in very simple terms, right? You can't sell new tech to anybody if they don't understand how it's useful to them. Right. So what I've done is I've made four master classes. It's basically about four hours of me talking to you about the opportunities and the things that are going on. And you can cherry pick what you want to what you want to watch and learn about. Um, and uh, you can get all that stuff if you go to blockchainwhales.com. So I partnered with Steve Trang, as you know, to, to build this community. Steve has such a large reach. Um, and then the other two partners in this business is, is the one guy who showed me how to build this business treasury, who helped Microsoft do the same. He's a partner with us. And, and another gentleman who is probably the best tech mind I've found in the blockchain space. So I'm learning a lot of this stuff from them. His name is Nick Peterson. Nick Peterson. Okay. So, yeah. so who are the, who are these members? Nick Peterson, Steve Trang, you. And Dan Nicholson. Dan just had a book uh, that came out. It just hit a, uh, Wall Street Journal bestseller last week. Uh, it's called Rigging the Game. And I mean, it's a, again, I, I don't want to share too much. I know we're kind of running out of time here, but yeah. these are my partners. These are the people who are, are shepherding us, you know, me through this process. Um, and we have figured out how to reduce the risk and earn cash flow consistently. And we are in the process of figuring out how do we make this stuff more useful to us as real estate investors. If you right. want to find out more about that, there's free masterclasses on my website, blockchainwhales.com. Just YouTube videos. Basically, you can just go watch this. I've broken it all down. How does all this work? Like, why is this opportunity exist in the first place? What is blockchain? Like, what is crypto? I've answered all those questions. And then we also have a free community uh, that you can join to stay up to date on this stuff, right? Like, we have a, our first fund launching six months into like starting our starting this business. It's incredible how fast we're moving. And that's Pete, um, right? That's, that's Pete. Pete. Exactly. Yeah. Pete Kavanaugh, you know, in North Carolina, he's in the Fayetteville market. Also, you know, left main user. So I get to like, you know, keep in touch with him too. I mean, what he's doing there with creating this fund so that these crypto people can invest in the fund that then is actually bought buying houses is like, Dude, that sounds really smart. How did you how, like? How are you? It is no. Pete right. blows me away. He's a he's yeah. a rock star, absolute rock star. But the thing is, is like we have the thousands of crypto investors already. We have them. We already have relationships with them. We also have relationships with thousands of real estate investors. The whole point of this was like, wait a second. Yeah. You guys would benefit tremendously from knowing these people, and you guys would like. How do we bring all this together in one spot? Because Real estate investors know nothing about crypto and crypto investors know nothing about real estate. And so that's the premise of this is how do we open up the lines across, right? It's building this bridge from one side to the other so we yeah. can let real estate investors tap the, I mean, trillion is like, that's a massive market that's untouched. Yeah. It's completely green. And the crypto investors, again, they don't want to deal with toilets. They don't want to do what we're doing. They just want to give us their money and they don't want to do it in cash. They just want to do it in a crypto and we'll take care of that, you know, from there. Yeah. I think this is very interesting. Like, you know, at the very least ear to the ground familiarity with what's happening here, you know, um, and seeing how it's applicable to, to our business. I, 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 you know, I kind of lump it into that. I want to know how real estate funds work and, and, and hedge funds work and how, how do they think and how do they buy properties? It's kind of the same that I have that same interest for that as I am starting to put together for, you know, these crypto funds, because I think that's the context that I understand, you know, mm -hmm. so it's, 
Well, and it's tech and some people are going to take a while to, to, to yeah. adopt it. Some people need to sit and watch. And we understand that. Um, yeah. I say this all the time. What came first, the FAA or the airplane? Well, the airplane came first. Of course. And guess what? Planes were falling out of the sky and people were dying. So like we had to have somebody come in and be like, hold on. This is what we're going to do to stay safe. You guys all have to f- abide by these standards. You can't do this. You can't do this. We don't right. have that regulation in crypto right now. And planes are falling out of the sky. So what do I predict? The government's going to come in and make regulations to make it safer. What happens when there's safety? As a fiduciary of any large entity, you now have a responsibility to get exposure to this market, right? Like without safety, you have no reason to be here. With safety, you should probably put 5% of your assets in there. BlackRock manages $10 trillion. What's 5% of that? $500 million? That's half of the market cap right now of crypto. So if, you know, again, I could talk about this for hours. I have. (laughs) <laughs> many, many, many hours. This is what I'm passionate about. My yeah. real estate business needs to get boring, reliable, predictable, because this is what I want to spend my time on. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it marries the two. And I think there's a lot of magic that happens when we cross industries. There's a lot to learn from that. You know, I've talked about that a lot with like medicine and real estate, like on how there's so many sim- similarities there. Um, but anyway, I know that we're up on time. This was really interesting. I, I really enjoyed listening to your story and then, you know, kind of what you're, what you're cooking now. It's cool. So yeah, thank you. Does anybody, before we jump off, anybody have any questions or any comments they want to, they want to present to Paul? Probably just confused more people than I, I hope, like, but that's the way it goes with this, with this new tech. So I'm trying well, my best, but. Um, I, think, I think there's lessons in the story and then there's just, we need to just kind of hear what's happening because it is such a buzzword. I think even if there's exposure on that, on that level of like basic concepts, I think there's value there. So. Yep. Well, check out blockchainwhales.com. I've done my best to make it as simple and um, using stories, not technical things. Like that's what I'm good at is explaining yeah. things in a way that uh, you can relate it to something you already understand. So if you want to learn more about it, just go check it out. Blockchainwhales.com. Cool. And we'll see, you know, see kind of feedback we get here. Maybe, maybe if there's more interest, we can talk about maybe get you and Pete on a call and talk about the the fund. I think that'd be kind of interesting too. I am jumping on a call right now to talk with Pete about just that on our, uh, inside of our, uh, well club community. So oh, cool, anyways, cool. yeah. Well, tell him I said, Hey, I will. Thanks for having me, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Bye. All right, guys. Bye.